sermon to ever preach uh, just because we've said some of this before. So we're going to look at this tonight. Uh, you know, when you get ready for a test, sometimes it's good to, to do a, a view, a review, uh, and a repeat, go over some of that stuff. And so some of these verses we've used tonight, uh, but I just feel in my heart when I look at them again, uh, just for the sake of, of saying we went through the whole sermon, I want to get through with this. Uh, so Matthew 5, we'll start at verse 13. As we concluded the Beatitudes, Jesus rolls from that and says this, you're the salt of the earth. Now, let me stop because I, I, I do this to myself sometimes. After he gives the Beatitudes, after he lays out these blessed beings, and he tells them how blessed they are and all the things they're going through, all the heartache, all the sorrow, all the things that he, he's, he's told them over and over and over again. And of course, we've read verse 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. He talked about mourning, he talked about hurting, he talked about suffering, he talked about uh, even when people were against you, speak ill towards you. And then he gets to this. After, after telling that group how blessed they were, he uses that as a platform to now explain to them what to do with their blessings. And so it's probably worth mentioning tonight, God doesn't do anything with a dead end. Everything God does is reciprocal. If God does something in your heart or in your life, it is to His goodwill and His pleasure for His honor and His glory. So if God works something in you, He doesn't intend for you to keep it or for it to stay there. He's working in you so He can work through you. And because He wants to work in us, through us, to reach others, to bring others to Christ. That's the point. It's to reciprocate His blessing. He gives the blessing. We receive the blessing. We share the blessing. And then the blessing, of course, comes back when another soul comes to Christ. You're the salt of the earth, he says. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. So what he says here is that we are the preservation. And that's a very interesting thought when he says to the people of God, you are my plan for preserving the earth. My intention through you is to preserve mankind, is to preserve the souls of men, is to preserve this that I have started in you, to continue this through you. You are this object that I have chosen to use in preservation and in the keeping. And listen to what he says. If the salt loses its savor, wherewith shall it be salt? So in order to be used as a preservative, we have to be preserved. We have to be kept. You've all seen salt shakers where people put rice in the salt because it wicks up the moisture and it keeps the moisture from affecting the salt. You do everything you can to protect the quality of the salt so that when it's time to use the salt, it'll work. Now, pastor, you get into some interesting things. And it used to be a lot more common than it even is now to be invited to somebody's house to eat all the time. People just invite you to come eat and all the time. I, I had an old man, uh, Brother Earl Thurman, he used to get tickled. He said, I always love it when Pat invites the preacher to come eat because I know she's going to clean the house if you come. You know? <laughs> and you get into some stuff. You, let, me, let me say this. Now, Earl didn't work one up. That, Miss Pat put a lot of pounds on me. But I'll say this. You go eat a lot of places, you don't want to eat. A lot of places that you have to go. <laughs> you know, you pick it up. If it turns me off, it, you know. <laughs> we sit down at the table one night and I got some salt. And I went to put some salt on some mashed potatoes and dead ants started falling out of the salt truck. I sprinkled dead ants off. What do you do? Well, you just eat them. And God has protein, right? Amen. <laughs> no, I didn't nurse them so bad. <laughs> salt is only good if it's been kept. The message within that is, is if we can, and we kind of dealt with some of that a little this morning, if we can really embrace our call, and, and you go up and down the road, and I hear people say all the time, this is one of these things people say in Union Parish, but you know what's funny, a lot of people that say this in Union Parish, they'll say there's a church on every corner, everywhere you look there's another church, a lot of people say that don't go to any of them. And I made a statement one time that, you know what? We still, in all the churches, in all the parish, there's still not enough seats to seat everybody. 22, 23,000 people living in the parish. 
And so when you really think about that, you understand that we have a job to do in preserving what God has called it. When you go up and down the road and you see a church, and I know denominationally we've got issues uh, with other churches doctrine wise. I know we don't we don't break fellowship, we don't despise other people. I thank God for people trying to reach folks for Jesus. I don't say necessarily that Baptists have a monopoly on the truth, but we do preach it as straight as we can. But I'll say this, when you ride up down the road, you see a New Testament church, you see a body of Christian believers, you see in salt. Now, some of that salt has been affected. Some of that salt has been tainted. I agree with that. But when you see those people sticking up all over these woods out here, you just think about that's God's means for preserving this place. Preserving this community. That's preservation. In order for us to be effective in preserving what God's called us to preserve, we have to be kept. We have to be maintained. Because I, I read a thing about salt that said I saw some salt that had been exposed to the sunlight, it had been exposed to the rain, and on the outside it was shining just like regular salt. But when you broke it open, it was no better than dirt. It had no more preserving qualities than a lump of dirt. And so what we have to see tonight is if we're going to be effective to do what God's called us to do, those who that are blessed, who are making peace, those who are blessed, who are mourning, those who are suffering, those who are trying, those who are fighting through all of those issues that He gives us in the Beatitude, if we're going to be this preservative factor that He's called us to be, we have to be kept from being affected. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be water slung at your fire. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be things that come against you to try to ruin your ability to be what God's called you to be. The point is, is that we have to strive to be kept through all of that. And the good news is, is what could have been used as a device of the devil can be turned into salt. See, actual salt, once it's messed up, it's burnt. Amen? But there's a lot of us in here that should have been burnt. But God preserved us. God restored us. God brought us back. And He says to this group of sinners that He's talking to, this group of men who were unqualified and unworthy, you're the salt of the earth. He didn't say this to the Pharisees or to the religious body of the day, he looked at this group of homeboys. Just people who loved him. Normal men who loved the Lord. And he says to them, you're the salt of the earth. And of course he talks about how if the salt loses its savor, which is what we're talking about, it's good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. Just like he said this morning, without me, you can do nothing. And so as we hold to this reality that we've been called to be this preserving factor in the world to help God's Word continue on and go forward in the church, we have to strive to be kept and strive to do the things God's called us to do. Preservation. You know what? You don't put salt on stuff that don't need it. I used to work in a meat market and we'd take that old bacon fat, that whatever that was, never cooked, never smoked, nothing. You just put it in a barrel of salt. And people would buy that stuff by the truckload to cook with, to use, to mess with. They, they, they called it salt pour. That's what they called it. They love that salt pour. And then we just pull that bucket down, whatever you want. We get the tongue, we pull out a big old chunk of just fat, just pig that had been laying in that old salt meat. People loved it. People wanted it. It had been preserved. You take a piece of pig and go lay it in the bucket somewhere without salt. Let it sit for about two weeks. Go get you a knife and fork and enjoy yourself. Amen? <laughs> You'd be glad to have some ants in there to sprinkle on <laughs> You don't put salt where it's not needed. If you taste something and it's already salty, then you don't put salt on it. What I'm trying to say is, is the reality is that there is a need tonight for preservation. There is a need tonight for people who stand on the stuff. There's a need tonight for a church to be true to the Word of God. Now we can do all the ministry stuff. We can feed the hungry. We can clothe the naked. We can house the, the homeless. We can do all of this stuff. But if what we do is not anchored on the, on the eternal Word of God, this is where theology comes into play. That for us to be this, this preservative that we've been called to be, there has to be some substance to what we are. It has to be deeper than a preacher. It has to be deeper than a congregation. It has to be deeper than all of our charm and charisma and razzle-dazzle. <laughs> it has to be some substance to what we're doing. And I'd say this with all of my heart tonight. If there's anything that can be said about what God does or is doing in a church, it's usually always traced back to the preaching of, the teaching of, the believing and obeying of the Word of God. When our ministries spring from that, 
When our ministries are built on that foundation, this is the whole point. Jesus says, if I'm the vine and you're the branches, you abide in me. How do we abide in him? How do we know him? We know it because of the preaching and teaching of the word of God. So we hope for this truth and we do what God's called us to do. Preservation. The second thing, verse 14 and 15, here's what else he says. I don't want to the salt of the earth. He says, you're the light of the world. And a city that's set on a hill can't be hid. I know when you say this word, well, there's some words I can say in here tonight that are, you know, if you were in a sales pitch, there's things you say and there's things you don't say. If, if you're a motivational speaker, there's things you say and there's things you don't say. If I want to pick you up tonight and get you happy about what we're talking about, I'd talk about happiness. I'd talk about prosperity. I'd talk about grace. Mercy, forgiveness, all this stuff is uplifting. None of that is bad stuff. None of that is stuff that doesn't exist. But the reality is, there are some things that have to be coupled with all those fun doctrines. You want to you bring the crowd back down? I'm going to do it in one word. Ready? Money. We want it. You got it. Amen? Because we're trying to use it. Don't get See what I'm saying? Money. You want me to tell you another one? This is a spiritual one. Holiness. Well, when you hear holiness, you think about a monk in a robe, and he's just, just holy, holy, holy. That just sounds so holy. Be holy. You know, you think about that, and it just doesn't seem flashy. It's not exciting. It's not, you know, people won't roll out of bed for holiness. <laughs> but when Jesus uses this statement that a city that's set on a hill can't be hid, the implication there is holiness. Is what good does it do to have a light to shine if you don't live a life that puts it in a place that it can be seen? What good does it do? You'd be the brightest light in all the world, but if you're under this pulpit right here, it's not going to help a lot of people. Our life has to be lived in a place that we're constantly climbing and pressing toward the mark. Paul had no mistake that Paul called it the high calling. That we get as far as we can get towards the Lord, we get as high as we can get, we let the light shine as bright as it shine, and the higher we get and the closer to Him we are, the brighter it shines, the more we can see. You're the light of the world. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, make an illustration and I want you to grab hold of this. If Jesus Christ had one church left and it was Antioch Baptist Church, if there was one body of believers left on this earth and it was you, he would stand right there and look at you tonight and say, you're the light of the world. So ask yourself, how bright is my light shining? And where is it positioned? Because my light needs to shine bright. And my light needs to shine like a city on a hill. Because no matter what you do, he said a city on a hill can't be hid. There's one that wants to hide your light. There's one that wants to bury the illumination in darkness. What do we say about salt? You don't apply salt where it's not needed. You don't shine light where it's already light. You don't go outside with a flashlight on a bright sunshiny day. No, you use the light when it's dark. And I believe you would agree with me tonight that the days we're living in are dark. And I, I probably, I, I think you just can't help but preach on the condition of our government and our society. And I don't think anybody necessarily intends to be political. But you understand the Democratic Party is fixing to run a socialist or a married homosexual for the President of the United States. Now let me give you a little backdrop to the homosexual part. The United Methodists just made a decision not long ago concerning ordaining homosexuals into the ministry of the Methodist Church. The decision was made in favor of not allowing homosexuals to be ordained, but it was because of a global representation of ambassadors of the Methodist Church from all over the world when it was said that predominantly the Methodist Church of the United States of America voted in favor of ordaining homosexuals. Now, let me tell you why the entire representation of the rest of the world flooded to this meeting to vote anti-ordaining homosexuals. Because the men that pastored and ministered on fields abroad if they had 
lined up with a religious group that was pro-homosexual, they would have murdered them in the streets where they served. Because of what they had stood for in the Methodist church, they voted to save their life. My question to you tonight is if our president is homosexual and the world already hates us, how do you think those who hope, we're the only, listen, we're the Lucy Goose Society. We're the ones that have no standards. We're the ones that say anybody, everywhere, every way, just do what you do and we love you. And if you need money, we'll pay you taxes for it, right? I, I'm sorry. <laughs> and socialism is a mask for communism. Amen. And so you want to call one racist. And I'm telling you tonight, communism is responsible for more slavery than anything this world has ever seen. I'm just saying to you tonight, there is darkness abounding in this world. Now here's what we've got. We've got a president that is not a politician. And he cannot keep his mouth shut. And he cannot keep his hand off of his Twitter. And I'm just telling you tonight, if they run a man that is a homosexual, they will do it with the intention that in some way, shape, or form, Donald Trump will say something that they can hold against him as bigotry and disqualify him from. You watch what your preacher's telling you tonight. So Michael Bloomberg stepped up. He's got, he's got a vice president. Y'all heard this? He wants Hillary to run with him. I'm just telling you tonight, I know that we have, I know that people who believe in conservative values and and I know folks on the right side, or whatever the case is, there was a shot in the arm and people got excited about Trump. But don't let your excitement or your enthusiasm turn into apathy because the days are still dark. The need is still there. We have got to keep pushing. We've got to keep praying. There has never been a moment that we can kick our heels up and say, Phew, we've got it made. Never, ever, ever. Because the devil's after us. Amen. And you want to talk about a headlock on the church? You want to talk about a group that tells us what we can't say? You let them put one in office that we adamantly preach against his lifestyle. And we believe that homosexuality is an abomination. It's not the sin of all sins, but it's one that God hates above several others. And I know we talk about categorizing sin, but I'm telling you tonight, homosexuality is a beast of a sin. Because it not only defies the word of God, it defies the very law of nature. You understand what I'm saying? If you don't believe me, find any plumber in the universe and ask them what they can do with two male parts. There wouldn't be a sewer system in the country. You understand what I'm saying? Ask them what they can do with two female joints. Absolutely nothing. God knows what He's doing. He made it like He wants it. He wants it like He made it. Amen? We just get raised up a bunch of homosexuals and let them just put us into absolute extinction. Because I don't know if you know this or not, and I don't mean to get off into all this stuff, but two homosexuals don't do any good for the furtherance of the human race. Amen. 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 You don't shine the light when it's light. You shine the light when it's dark. And I just want to shake us tonight and say, it's dark, baby. It's dark. Get on the hill and shine the light. Do it with aggression. Do it with intention. Don't just, you know, our kids get a flashlight. Sometimes you play with a flashlight. We can't play with a flashlight tonight. We got to light the fire. We got to heat wood on it. And we got to let it burn. As long as we let it burn, we got to stand for something. And that's what Jesus says to us tonight. I believe it with everything that's in me. If he came to this room tonight, he'd look to this if this was the only church left. And he'd say, and I, he'd probably look at me and say, a little bit scared. You're the light of the world. We've got to do something. If we ever prayed, if we ever did work, if we ever supported missionaries, if we ever got behind those who preached the gospel, if we ever did everything in our power to go share the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you it's now. Right now. Illumination. Preservation. Illumination. You're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. But listen to what he says. When they light the candle, they put it on a candlestick and it gives light to all that are in the house. The Bible says in Matthew 13 in the parable of the wheat and the tares, 
that the wheat and the tares were so similar that once there was a mingling of the wheat and the tares, there was no way to deal with it until judgment. Because the tares looked so much like the wheat that if somebody, even with good intention, went to pull up the tares, they'd pull up the wheat also. They would hurt good people also. If I was to say tonight, it's time for us, let's close the doors, lock them up. We're going to find everybody in this room tonight that's been planted in this church by the devil, and we're going to take a chair and whoop them. The implication is we whoop somebody that didn't need it. We whoop somebody that actually was a good Christian. They just didn't look like we wanted them to look or sound exactly like we thought they should sound. And also, that there would be some that deserve to get whooped with that chair that we let slide because we don't have sense enough to tell the difference between the wheat and the tear. So the point is this, in Matthew 13, Jesus said, you know how this, this happened? How the enemy came in and sowed tears among the wheat? He says, while men slept. The enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. Now it'd be easy for us to think about that in a nightly setting, but the, 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 the application is this, is that during a season of slumber, the enemy comes in and he disrupts the harvest. He comes in and he disrupts the work of the Lord. And so what I'm saying to you tonight, when we shine the light, I don't know how y'all sleep at your house, but we sleep with the light on. Sometimes when you shine the light, it makes people uncomfortable. Have you ever been in a room, you turned the light on and didn't realize somebody was in there asleep and they hollered, turn the light out! What do you do? Ooh, you run, turn the light out. <laughs> there are people in our society that are fine with sleeping. They're okay with being in slumber while the devil runs rampant and sows this seed throughout our nation. And I'm telling you that it's going to make some people uncomfortable when you turn the light on and keep it on. But we're not at their disposal to do as they ask us or tell us to do. We're here on a mission from heaven to shine the light. And Jesus said, don't you like that light? Put it under a bushel. You let it shine. And if it makes those who are asleep uncomfortable, let it shine. And if it shines on the sin of those who need to be converted and they rebel and they turn on you and they hate you for it, let it shine. Because there will be those who by the power of God by grace, will see their sin and run to Jesus. And that's why Jesus says here, you're the light of the world. A city that's built on a hill can't be hid. Neither will a man light a light and put it under a bushel. No, he puts it on a candlestick to light all the house. <laughs> Preservation, illumination. You ready to bring it home? Say, bring it home, Ruth. Bring it home. Application. Here's what he said. Salt is no good in the shaker. To preserve, it has to be kept. To preserve, it has to be applied. <laughs> light is no good at the bottom of the hill. You've got to live a life that gets it up the hill. Life is no good. Light is no good under the bushel. Light is no good under the pulpit. That's why the lights are in the ceiling. And not under here. Because this may help somebody, but that helps everybody. So illumination. Alright, here's the application. After giving these tremendous illustrations, he looks to the people and he says this. Let your life, don't let his life, her life, not your wife's life, not your husband's life, not your parents' life, not your children's life, not your church's life, not your preacher's life, let your life, let your light shine like a city on a hill, like a candle on a candlestick. Let your light so shine. Listen to what he says. That men might see your good works before men. Said, that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What did we say this morning? I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me and I abide in you. And you'll bear much what? Fruit. In John 15, 8, Jesus said, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much. That you bear much. Amen. So here's what he says. Let your light so shine before men. They might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Herein is your Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So let your fruit bear and be seen. So that others may come to know Christ and bear that same fruit. Be able to carry on the fruit of the Spirit. To be able to share and bear the fruit of the Lord, the fruit of the harvest, 
so that Jesus might be glorified. Because we don't need to see a political party. Can I say something to you tonight? There's trouble brewing in the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm talking about trouble. There's already six or seven camps. And there's some lines being drawn. And I believe, I believe very soon we're going to see a parting of ways. When that happens, this church is going to have to make a decision. And I can tell you what it's going to make if you let me be the pastor. We're going to stand with this book. Amen. I don't care about all that other stuff. I'm going to stand with this book. I might stand it by myself. But I'm, I'm going to stand with this book. We're going to stand with this book. Because this is the light. This is the salt. And we're just kind of the, 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 the socket and the shaker. We don't have anything to shine or anything to show or anything to give without this. This has been the subject of debate from the onset. Because the lesser of this, the more people you can get. But what have you got if it's not built on this? I'd rather have a hundred people that shout Jesus by the authority of the Word of God than a thousand people that can't quote John 3.16 because we ain't got sense enough to tell them the truth. The truth divides people. No doubt about it. But we have no choice. Because we're not here for people and we're not here for each other. We're here for Jesus. So we're going to do what He says the way He says and we're going to do the best we can. I've never gone to the Southern Baptist Convention in my life. But I'm going to make plans to go. Because I've got a voice and we have a part. We as a church have a seat at the table and we have to be represented. Yeah. Because there are men and women of faith, men and women of God who believe like we believe and it's time for us to stand up and do something or we're fixing to lose the influence of what is the second biggest religious denomination in the world tonight to Roman Catholicism. You don't want to pull away from the influence. You don't want to pull away from the ability that we have to reach people. But I guarantee you one thing. We're not standing with anybody that doesn't stand for this book. Amen. 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 Because we've been told by the authority of Scripture, we have a job to do. And that is to let men see what God has done in and through us by the authority of His Word so that they too can be converted. Pray with your pastor. Let's pray as a people. Because I'm telling you, we have got the influence in this association of churches to change the world. The power is there. But we've got to stay with the stuff. That's on a global level, a convention level, an association level, a church level, a personal level. We've got to stand on what we know to be true. And do what God's called us to do. Y'all stand with me. Father, we love you. God, we thank you tonight for your word. And I pray tonight that we understand our duty as preservers. That we understand tonight our duty to let this light shine. And that we understand tonight our obligation not to simply know what it means to be salt and know what it means to let a light shine, but to go out and be the salt and be the light. Let men see our works that have been spurned by your grace. Works that we couldn't do if it weren't for the saving power of God. Didn't you tell us in the Word? By faith we're saved. By grace we're saved through faith. Not of ourselves, the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man boast. But it tells us we're your workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And then you tell us to let our good works be seen by men and women in this world. That they might see them. And glorify our Father which is in heaven. I pray tonight that you bless this church. I pray tonight you bless our membership. I pray that you bless our association, our influence. I pray tonight you bless this Southern Baptist Convention. I thank you for men and women of faith who are standing for what's right. And I pray tonight, Lord, that there might not ever be division, but if there ever is, it will be where we're supposed to be on the side you want us to be on. I pray tonight that you bless us and help us and keep us and let us never be distracted. May it be political. May it be in the government. May it be in the world, in the news, in the media. Let nothing distract us from the task at hand. And that is that we have men, women, boys, and girls to go share the gospel with because it will change your life. Change
change their eternal destination. Bless us as a church tonight. Help us to take this word and, as David said, hide it in our heart. We might not sin against you. Lord, keep us on that hill. Keep us on that candlestick. Use us for your honor and for your glory that men and women might be saved. Bless our invitation tonight. Accomplish your will in Jesus' name. Amen.